this evening and um, just looking forward to worshiping and hearing God's word with you. Would you stand and we'll get started. Father, we just come before you tonight and um, we can do nothing on our own strength, Lord. And I just pray tonight, Lord, that we would just lay all the weight of um, the things that are carrying on us, Lord, that we would just lay it at your feet and just really be free of those burdens tonight, Lord. And just be at your feet and just marvel in your goodness, Lord, and your love for us. And I pray that worship would be pleasing to you and that um, that uh, our praises would just be really sweet to your ears, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. seat if you'd like and we'll continue with worship. Thank you. 
Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. This is an old one. You guys might recognize it. You might not. It's a beautiful song. So um, I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Actually, it's a couple songs I liked. <laughs> Spirit draws me in. 
again. Let's stand together while I pray, and just a blessing as always to be with you tonight, and continuing on in the book of Proverbs, let me open in prayer, and uh, Justin, Megan, thank you for leading us in worship. Father, we thank you and praise you for your tremendous love for us, your tremendous goodness towards us, and we're so thankful we have a Savior who's work was completely and thoroughly done on that cross. You did thoroughly pay for our sins, and tonight we rest at peace with you, knowing that you have done so great a job, and by faith we get to walk with you and trust in you, have the power of your Holy Spirit to live this life. And so tonight as we study your word, would you give it all the intended influence and uh, just all that you intended to do in our lives? We pray that we, by your Spirit, would understand it and apply it and live it. And so thank you, Lord. Bless us now, we pray, as we study this proverb. And we want you to be honored as our hearts are towards you and towards learning from you and from, the, from your Holy Spirit. So bless us, we pray, Lord. We do ask all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. All right, last week we got halfway through Proverbs chapter 20. We got to verse 16, so or 15 we pick up in verse 16. Very quick introduction, not much at all. We continue in the second major section. Remember, section one of Proverbs was chapters one to nine. We're in chapters 10 now through 24. And uh, next week we'll actually hit, there's kind of a little bit of a, a shift and a little bit of an, a difference at the very end of this section, midway through chapter 22 and in through chapter 24 before we get to the last sections. But we just continue tonight in this section of these great statements and uh, we went through many contrasts really in chapters 10 to 15. We continue with more kind of affirmations here. And let's pick up in verse 16. And we do read here. Take the garment of one who is surety for a stranger and hold it as a pledge when it comes, when, when it is for a seductress. So that's an interesting statement. Let's remember this is not the first time at all the Lord's talked about being surety. He doesn't typically look very favorably whatsoever on surety, which the equivalent today is being a surety or co-signing a loan, something like that, guaranteeing somebody else would make good on a debt of some kind. And uh, let me remind you of a couple of places. Proverbs 11, uh, 15 says, He who is surety for a stranger will suffer, but one who hates being surety is secure. Proverbs 17, verse 18, Man devoid of understanding shakes his hand in the pledge and becomes surety for his friend. And I've mentioned a couple of times, one of the reasons I think the Lord is not for that is because if a person needs to, to receive money, they may try to go get a loan. And the Lord, of course, looks down uh, quite a bit on lending and becoming slave to the, to the lender. But if, if they can't get a loan and then they can't even go to the world, in effect, in, in a bank and get a loan, uh, maybe they're not trustworthy. Maybe it's not wise that they have that. And sometimes when the certain person doesn't have funds, it can be the Lord's way of saying no to someone. We can actually interject there and short circuit something the Lord's trying to do in helping somebody get a loan they really shouldn't have. Now, I do find this one to be a bit interesting because please notice there it says, take the garment of one who is surety for a stranger. Under the law, if you were to loan someone money, and let's say their guarantee or their collateral to you was a, was a garment, you were to give it back to them at night. So if that might be a garment they use to, to keep themselves warm. And so, it, man, if you give a loan, you better be serious about that loan, getting their garment every day and giving it back. And that's kind of tedious. 
but you look at that, but this is, this is a little bit worse. So take the garment of one who is surety for a friend. If you take their garment, in effect, you've loaned them money. If you're loaning them money, they sure shouldn't be surety for another. This is almost like even more so a reason why that person shouldn't, be, shouldn't have been a surety for another person. They can't even take care of their own debts. And so it's just very interesting. And again, it looks down upon that. And of course, notice he ends with, and hold it as a pledge when it is for a seductress. Now, I do believe this, this verse can be misleading in that word seductress. It really primarily means foreigner or stranger. So it's actually, in effect, I think, uh, uh, reaffirming in this verse, uh, you should at least know somebody if you're going to loan them money, generally speaking. Now, you could see some you've never met before on the street, and poor and the Lord could bleed on your heart to bless them and give them some money or loan to them. We're supposed to lend without expectation of return. And the Lord may tell us to do that. But uh, we're talking about a stranger, and we want to have some sense of uh, character, typically speaking, if we were to loan money to someone. So this one's just a little bit uh, different, really. But it really both talks about a stranger or a foreigner and the danger of uh, loaning to somebody you really don't even know. Verse 17, bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man. Now, that's a, a sad verse, but if somebody tries to gain bread by deceit, uh, that's through some kind of stealing lying deceit to get uh, something out of them and of course would that be sweet so gain, bread guy, gained by deceit is sweet to a man so you might think it's sweet that i didn't have to pay for it but that should never be and there's no real lasting peace no lasting joy when it's not gained by good hard work to earn the money to pay for it or that somebody cared enough for you to give it to you and then uh, notice this interesting saying though I mean, it doesn't do any good for your conscience to gain something by deceit unless you've hardened your conscience or seared it, but afterward his mouth will be filled with gravel. That's a picture, isn't it? Have you, have you ever been slightly tempted to take a handful of gravel and shove it in your mouth? I mean, that's just insanity, what you're going to do to your teeth and the damage you're going to do, and that's the imagery the Lord uses. The bread gained by the sweet, yeah, it may, be, it may taste sweet to you, but afterward, it's like mouth full of, filled with gravel. I mean, you do have the worry of being caught if you stole, and just the lack of peace. There's no joy in eating that. I mean, you may need it to feel full or not be starving hungry, but there's just no lasting joy. There's no peace in that kind of a lifestyle. And so the Lord gives us a very graphic picture here of the beauty of just being honest in our dealings uh, in this world. Let's be honest in what we do. Verse 18, plans are established by counsel. Just a wise reminder that, yes, God's given us plenty of wisdom by his word, by the ministry of his Holy Spirit, but then also there is the, let's face it, wisdom is one of the gifts of the Spirit, and we, we all tend to know someone that has just amazing wisdom from the Lord, and it's wise to seek the counsel of those people, especially in major decisions in life. What a blessing to have the body of Christ, to have these gifts and go, I need some wisdom for you. This is a serious decision. Help me here. I want your input. And so, but even more so if you're going to wage war, look at that, by wise counsel, wage war. You sure do not want to get into a war without knowing and confidently knowing. It may seem weird, but you need to know the Lord's in it. David would often ask the Lord, Lord, do you want me to go to battle? How do you want me to go to battle? He would even direct him how to handle the battle. Let's face it, we have wars in this world. If man weren't evil, inherently evil, we wouldn't have these wars, but we do have them. And so we need to know that the Lord is in this and how we're to fight this battle. By, by the way, let's make this uh, personal. What about in a marriage? I mean, it'd be a big blown up war. We need to be very careful how we treat each other. Sometimes it's amazing how, you ever notice you can be like arguing for 30 minutes ago, how did this even start? Sort of some dumb, really totally insignificant thing. And you're just picking this war. That wasn't wise counsel that led you to that. We should be loving and kind and careful with each other. But it takes wisdom to decide when to pick a fight, when not to, how to handle issues in life. Let's use counsel from the Lord in these things. Verse 19, he who goes about as a talebearer, really speaking of a gossip, reveals secrets. Therefore, in light of that, in light of the fact that a gossip will tell your secrets, you know, it's interesting that you can have a friend and you can let them in, right? One of, the, one of the beauties of friendship is you let your guard down and you can be intimate with them. Hopefully they're faithful to you. But when a gossip goes and tells some of your deepest, darkest things and because you've let your guard down to them, for them to violate that trust is really harmful and hurtful. And so it, we just can't do that to a friend and be that to a friend. But it's interesting how some people like to be the one that reveals the secret when it's really just unhealthy 
and it's gospel without the permission of the friend. Anyway, he says, in light of that, don't associate with anyone who flatters with his lips. As Lord makes an interesting connection, typically flattery speaks of an excessive uh, commending of someone. It's one thing to say, hey, you really did that well. That could be very appropriate. But typically, flattery has this angle of manipulation because I'm going to excessively compliment you to get you to see things the way I, I want you to do, I want you to, or to do things I want you to do. And, and because he put it in the same verse, he's linking that in effect a person that's a talebearer, they're, they're that same type of person that would flatter and try to, in effect, manipulate people with their mouths. That should never be done. We need to keep our commitments to be... Uh, to be serious about people telling us stuff. And if we're not sure it's private, we need to keep it that way until we get their permission. Let's not be hurting each other. Let's certainly not be using flattery to try to win people over. It's not healthy, and the Lord certainly condemns that in Scripture. Verse 20, whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in deep darkness. There you go. Aren't you glad we're not under the law of Moses? Under the law of Moses, Exodus 21, 15, he who curses his mother and father shall be put to death. Now, be honest. How many of you would live past 15? 15? 16? I mean, let's face it. We all have that wicked part of our hearts that some of you get angry at your parents. You don't get your way and you curse them. It might be a minor curse. But we're never to do that. God put them in our lives to be a picture of him leading and guiding us. Now, the they're doing the best they can, typically speaking. They're not God. They're going to make mistakes. We're to be thankful for them. We're not to curse them. Of course, he says, if you strike them, they were to be put to death as well. But even just cursing under the law of Moses was enough for death. He said, yeah, his lamp will be put out. Now, you have to admit, I don't think we should do this today. That was the very specific purpose the Lord had to communicate. The bigger communication is that spiritually, to curse your heavenly father, you will die eternally. That's what he was lovingly communicating. I'm glad our society doesn't carry that out. Because again, we wouldn't have lived through uh, childhood. And so we, we would have been put out. And so again, the bigger issue, let's, let's be right before, let's never curse the, the Lord, our Heavenly Father. But uh, that person's lamp will be put out. They need to learn that. They're supposed to learn submission to their parents so that later they can easily transfer that submission to the Lord spiritually. Anyway, he moves on. An inheritance gained hastily at the beginning will not be blessed at the end. And I can't help but think of that. Think about today. I know we've seen it almost like in the gossip columns. I'm not recommending you listen to that. But you see people that their parents left them millions upon millions of dollars at a young age. And you just, you just groan because they don't have anywhere near the character, spiritual or otherwise, to handle that kind of wealth. It's incredibly dangerous to give a lot of wealth. At least I see the wisdom now. You know, you can, you can set up a trust... And it takes wisdom. If you have a lot of wealth you're leaving to your children, really seek the Lord. Sometimes it's wise to give them a little bit and wait a little bit longer. Wait till they get a little bit wiser to the place we hope they can handle that with the character that's needed. So to get, to get wealth early can be very, very dangerous. So inheritance gained hastily at the beginning will not be blessed at the end. We really want the character to be in place for a person to handle that kind of wealth as the Lord gives it to them. And as parents, we should use wisdom from the Lord as to how much our children can handle. Are we preparing them for whatever may be left them? Of course, let's never forget, we have a tremendous inheritance in the Lord. Spiritually in the Lord, it's one of the reasons the Lord doesn't want uh, elders or leaders in the church to be elevated quickly. He wants them to have some maturity. There's a wealth we already have in the Lord, a fabulous wealth, but then to be established as a leader, there can be almost a sense of a spiritual wealth early. They're not ready to handle that either. And so this has both physical and spiritual implications here, this particular verse. Verse 22, do not say, I will recompense evil. Wait for the Lord and he will save you. This is just a warning against letting your flesh get involved. Somebody does something, you get, you get angry and you lash out and you make a disaster of it. Sometimes the, thing, the way we lash out looks worse than the thing done to us in the first place. And then we make a terrible mess and then we mar our own reputation in, in taking vengeance on someone. We need to leave it to the Lord. Our problem with our anger is we tend to go too far. The Lord's the only one who always goes just the right distance when it comes to disciplining someone. And so we need to leave vengeance to him. Remember Revel, uh, Romans 12, 19, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For his written vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Don't, 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 don't take matters into your own hands. Don't become a vigilante spiritually. Wait on the Lord. He'll take care of you. 
and save you. Now the next one, another verse on diverse weights and honesty in our dealings. Diverse weights are an abomination to the Lord. Dishonest skills are not good. So we've, again, we've already seen several of these. Proverbs 11, 1, dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 20, 10, dishonest weights and diverse scales, they both like are an abomination to the Lord. And all, all of these, it seems like every time the Lord talks about diverse weights, he seems to bring in the word abomination. To me, it almost seems like hate on steroids. God hates dishonesty, hates it. And we need to be honest in our dealings. So to deceive someone, They've worked hard for what they've earned and then we deceive them and take more than should be taken in a deal. That is dishonoring to the Lord. That is not good. Notice he just says, that is not good. It's not good. I don't want to displease the Lord in that way. Let's be very honest in our dealings and, good, and be good representatives of the Lord in our dealings in this world. Verse 24, a man's steps are of the Lord. How then can a man understand his own way? So a man's steps are of the Lord. Now notice this verse has the word steps and way. And remember that the word way speaks of how we, uh, how we, uh, how we live our lives. It's, it's we're on a path. We walk a certain way, we're on a certain path in life. We're on a path that leads to life, we're on a path that leads to destruction. And so the way we're on is signified by the steps we take, the individual decisions. And our individual decisions are supposed to be of the Lord. So am I seeking the Lord? Do I wake up in the morning, spend time in the Lord, spend time in his word and say, Lord, I want you to lead me and guide me today. Have the blessing of knowing the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm actively listening and know how to hear his voice. We're to be growing in that. So I want even during the day, if I'm about to make a decision, I just that prompting of the Lord, a lack of peace. Okay, I have to hesitate here for a minute. Lord, what do you want here? So let's make sure our steps are of the Lord. And how can a man understand his own way? Very simply, only by seeking the Lord in his will. That's how we know the right way and the way the Lord has planned for us. Let's let the Lord do that leading for us. Verse 25, uh, it is a snare for a man to devote rashly something as holy. Now this speaks of somebody that makes a hasty vow. Have you ever been in a situation, say, do you remember, what's the old line about the man and that there's no atheist in a foxhole? You know, that's line. Somebody's in war and they think, oh, it's over, I'm dying here. And then we start making all these vows to the Lord. Oh, Lord, if you get me out of this, you'll do all this and that and the other. And we're not to make hasty vows. We're, if you make a vow, great. Make a vow to the Lord, but you got to keep it. The Lord's very, very deadly serious about keeping our vows. And so you look at the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 3, that whole chapter was dedicated to vows and the sobriety of keeping that vow. Do you remember when the Gibeonites kind of cheated and deceived Joshua? And, and told him they didn't live in the land. He made a treaty with them. Even though he'd been deceived, God expected him to keep his vow. He's very serious about vows. So there's some things in life we vow things. Don't, make sure you pray. And if you really want to be serious, vow that to the Lord, but keep it. Be very serious. New Testament equivalent of that is the very simple verse where Jesus said, simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. If you say something, keep it. Sometimes plans change and they're out of our control. Can't fix that. But we're to keep our word, not only to God, but to our fellow man. So it's, again, a snare for a man to devote rashly something. Let's not make quick decisions to offer something to the Lord and afterward to reconsider his vows. You don't want to do that. Let's make sure we took the time to seek the Lord in these things. Verse 26, we're going to read a few verses tonight about kings. A wise king sifts out the wicked and brings the threshing wheel over them. Now, this is actually a graphic verse here, too. You know, what he's basically saying is a good king will deal with evil. I think Romans 13 is one of the greatest examples of this. He talks about how the governing authorities are here as a minister of God to, to basically to, to, keep, to keep order and peace in a society. And they'll use the sword if needed. And so he's talking about order. And a good king will, will be active and serious about putting good people in place to find evil and to sift it out. And look at, the, look at the sobriety of what God says about sifting them out. Because this is a pretty, pretty graphic picture. You think about a threshing wheel. And so often you think about that ox. And they would have the, the big long uh, wheel that would be there. And they'd have a trough that would be in a big full circle. And, the ox, and they would put the wheat in there. And the ox would drag that huge wooden wheel that would just crush the wheat so they can separate the wheat from the chaff. Well, that wheat doesn't like that very much. Imagine that being a person. That's the image. Look at the image. 
So a good, a wise king sifts out the wicked and brings the threshing wheel over them. It's like we need to crush and separate the wheat from the chaff, that which is good with, from that which is bad. And a good king will do that. A good leader will be right and just in his judgment and, and, and let the innocent go free. So God so cares about justice. We're seeing a few verses on that tonight. Uh, verse 27 is a, also a pretty graphic verse. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. The first one, I love the picture because remember, as humans, we're a trinity. We're body, soul, and spirit. So you've got your physical body. Come, I call it your flesh, the old man, whatever you want to call it. Then you've got your soul, your mental and emotional capacity, thinking and emotions, and then your spirit. You were born dead spiritually. You and I were born in the image of our parents, not in the image of God. Adam and Eve were made in the image of God, but then they died and they, they passed on their human, their spiritual death to their children. They were born in their image. We're born in our parents' image, dead spiritually. And then when the Holy Spirit came live, come to live in us, we finally had the light of God in us again. Jesus is the light of the world. His word is the, la the light, the lamp to our feet. And then you look at this and go, well, the Holy Spirit came into me. So the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. The light in you is God himself. The Shekinah glory of God living in you. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. Isn't that great? We carry the very light of God in us wherever we go. And I love that imagery. And, and, and uh, let's see, and searching all the inner depths. Not only does he bring light, but all those ugly, dusty cobwebs and all those wicked parts of your heart. He's close, slowly working all that out. David knew what he said. We said, Lord, search me and know me. Search out those wicked parts of my heart. Give me your heart. And so we want the Lord to do that in our lives. Let his heart search you. Let his word search you uh, to become more like Christ. Okay, what does he say next? Mercy and truth preserve the king. We just talked about a king in verse 26, being willing to sift out the wicked. And now he's talking about mercy and truth preserve the king. Now, typically speaking, you would hope if a king is good, the people would really love being under that king's leadership. Sad today, we see many political leaders are just flat out biblically evil in the decisions they make. But typically, mercy and truth shall preserve the king. Our God is full of mercy and truth. And by loving kindness, he upholds his throne. That's a good picture of God. His throne is all about loving kindness. Our God is love. So, be, so a good king will care about mercy and truth. He'll care about loving kindness. And that is what his throne should be based upon, is that goodness uh, in, in living. All right, the glory of young men is their strength. Isn't that the truth? Do any of you remember when you had that? A little older in life? You know, every, every, every kind of se section in life, whatever you want to call it, era in life, season in life, they have their benefits, don't they? When you're young, you have strength. Problem is you don't have the wisdom that you're gonna have, hopefully, when you get older. And don't you wish you had that wisdom when you were younger, when you had all those muscles and everything, and you could do anything? And now you have to figure out your way through wisdom to do things. But it's interesting, here's the comparison. The glory of young men is their strength, but the splendor of old men is their gray head. The picture is, wisdom. gray head is supposed to be a picture of I've lived a few days, I've actually gained some wisdom somewhere. That's what it's supposed to represent. So you get old, there are not very many benefits of getting older, but hopefully loving the Lord and wisdom, those are the two. Oh, and there's the benefit of knowing I am gonna get a new body soon. Yes, thank you, Lord, please. Because this old one's, the seams are tearing apart, the tent pegs are not doing so, you know the drill. So anyway, we're getting older. So I hope you're seeking out the Lord for more wisdom. Never, ever stop seeking the Lord to the very end. We want all the wisdom he has for us and to get to impart that to your children, your grandchildren, hopefully your great-grandchildren. That is a blessing in that way. Okay, blows that hurt cleanse away evil. Now, there you go. I actually believe this is speaking of corporal punishment. Some people don't like that today, but when done well, done properly, not in anger. You have to make all these qualifications today. I mean, they're, they're right. But you know what's interesting? Blows that hurt do tend to cleanse away evil. If done right, you say, child, that's going to hurt you more than it hurts me. What do you say? It's going to hurt me more than you, what a parent say? Come on. It does hurt the mom and dad to, sometimes to discipline, but the kid needs it sometimes. Remember, you're, you're God's kid. 
He's not afraid to hurt you if he needs to, to get your attention. He, he's not afraid to discipline us. He talks about scourging us in Hebrews 12. So sometimes we need that. But blows that hurt cleanse away evil. It wakes a person. The whole point of discipline is that the discipline is worse than the, how much I desire to do that thing that I did that deserved the punishment. And so we want to make sure that it matches the crime, so to speak, but it will drive away that foolishness out of the child's heart, as do stripes the inner depths of the heart. Now, I only feel like the Lord only knows how to really uh, speak to us in the inner way that he disciplines us. The stripes of the Lord, the inner, the inner depths of the heart. God knows how to get in there and really get our attention and discipline us in a way that really works. So we get to trust the Lord with that, too. He's so full of wisdom in how he uh, deals with us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us enough to discipline us. Remember, he says he disciplines everyone that he loves. Don't think God's disciplining you because he hates you. He does it because he loves you. Think of a good coach that you had when you were growing up. Why, are they, why is a good coach really hard on a kid? Because of the potential he sees. And so he needs to drill that discipline into that child. All right, chapter 21. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. This is one of my favorite of all the verses in Proverbs. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. The power and almighty sovereignty of God. He can move a king's heart like it's nothing. Don't ever please get into a situation you think you're out of control. I'm not going to live through this. God can do anything at any moment. It's, it's an issue of faith. It's easy to say I'm not in a tough situation right now. But are we really going to trust the Lord? He can move on anyone. I think of Pharaoh and how God moved upon his heart. Of course, he hardened his own heart quite a bit. In fact, the word for hardening there is different what he did to himself primarily with what the Lord did. And finally, at the end, after he hardened his heart, so many times God really did come in and harden his heart, and he paid a tremendous price. I think of Nebuchadnezzar when he tried to stand up to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You, you, bow, you better bow down to my gold image. No, we won't. And he was really touched by that when he said, the fourth one's like the Son of Man. We saw the other one in that furnace with them. Or I think of the, the, the next chapter. Let me read one of the scenes. The Lord so humbled Nebuchadnezzar, because he can move a king's heart like water. He can bring about situations to do that. It says, after he had his wake-up moment, when he basically almost went insane, seven seasons, it was a debate how long those seasons were, but in Daniel 4, he, he himself wrote, this decision is by decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdoms of men. He gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. So Nebuchadnezzar got woken up by the Lord. He knows how to get someone's attention and he can change anyone's heart and turn them around. So. Anyway, it is in the hands of the Lord. We can always trust. By the way, this is one of the other reasons in 1 Timothy 2 we're told to pray for all kings, all in authority. Please never give up on anyone in authority, no matter how evil their decisions are. God loves them and wants them saved. Please don't give up on anyone. Let's be praying for all in authority. Verse 2, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. Isn't it? You ever noticed how good you are? I'll say you. I should say we. Have you noticed how good we are at justifying our sin or our decisions? Yeah, but you don't know. It's complicated. Eh, amazing how we think we're right in our own eyes. Amazing. But the Lord weighs the hearts. So what this verse is really telling us, what you think doesn't matter a lick. Only what God thinks matters. It's not, it's not whether it's right in your own eyes. We can justify just about anything. God, what do you say about this? That's all I care about. What do you say? So God weighs the heart. He's the one. His word is the standard, not me, not my wishes, not my emotions, not any of that. God is the decider. So let's make sure we're matching everything up and deciding every way we take, every decision we make is of the Lord and in line with the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Verse 3. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. This is a verse that's very, very important especially for the religious person. I say that knowing there's a religious person at some level in every one of us. Don't think of some particular group right now, ourselves. I think the best way to think of this is a child. You tell a child to do something and they flatly defy your word and then they try to come bring you a gift to try to smooth it over. Would you rather have the gift or the obedience in the first place as a parent? Of course you'd rather have the obedience. I don't want your gift. I'd rather you just obey me, child. I have lived a few years. I know what's best for you. 
please, please, for your own sake, for your own health, spiritual and, and emotional health, just obey me. And that's what the Lord is saying in this verse. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable than sacrifice to bring something afterwards to try to appease God or look for his forgiveness. And he's amazingly forgiving. He'll give it. But he'd much rather you just obey in the first place. Let's seek to obey the Lord and please him from the beginning. Verse 4, a haughty look. He lifts three things. A haughty look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked are sin. For some reason, Solomon just stops from it and says, I want you to know three things that are called sin by God. A haughty look. Haughty, the word literally speaks of being high. It's a person that thinks so much of themselves they look down on another person. And that's insane to do. Because at whatever level you're smarter or better at anything, it's because God gifted you to do that. Why would I look down on them? And, there's, and anybody you would look down on, there's some areas in their lives they're better in some areas than you are. So it's just foolish to be haughty. A proud heart. To be prideful. Why? Again, any gift, anything you have comes from the Lord. And a heart deep down, pride is so dangerous to think I'm better in any way than someone. Pride's why Satan fell. Pride is involved in any sin we commit. And then the last one, uh, notice, I, I think it's interesting progression just in this little verse. The first two talk about thinking, haughty look, a proud heart. But then he mentions what's going to result out of a haughty look and a proud heart? Wicked deeds and the plowing of the wicked. So plowing speaks of actually going through some effort to do something and to do something wicked. And if I'm haughty and looking down on people, I'll think I can abuse people and somehow I'm justified in doing that. And we're never ever to do that to anyone. So let's not be prideful, let's not be haughty. The problem is if you ever think you're prideful, please compare yourself to Jesus and he'll put you back in your place properly. And then you'll just be amazed he's willing to save you. Thank you, Lord, for loving me so much. Verse 5, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. He's already mentioned a couple of things about haste today in verse 21 of the last chapter, inheritance gained hastily at the beginning. But the plans of the diligent, so there's a comparison of, the, of, a, of a man that takes the time to plan carefully. I plan carefully. I even, I even seek the will of the Lord. Lord, is this what you want from me? I want to make these plans. I want to make sure they're your plans. I want to make sure they're pleasing to you. What do you want for me? So the plans of the diligent do lead to plenty. The greatest plenty is spiritual plenty. You may have great plans in life. They may not lead to, spirit, to physical wealth ever, but the fullness of the spiritual wealth the Lord wants to provide us, oh, can't put a price on that. That is plenty. For those of everyone who's hasty, Let's face it, how many decisions have you made in haste in your life you've seriously regretted? But how many decisions did you take a long time to really consider? How many of those have you regretted? Haste is a dangerous thing. You ever notice, why is it that people come to your door to try to sell you something? Why is it, why only today? Can't wait till tomorrow. They usually are operating without you having full information. And I, to me, I immediately know you're manipulating me when you're trying to take away my ability to choose. That's, to me, that's the definition of, of, of manipulation. You're taking away my ability to choose. If your product's that good, you'll offer me that discount tomorrow when I can do some investigation. Don't let people push you into a hasty decision. Make sure the Lord is in it and you can honestly tell them, everything I own is the Lord's. By the way, use that if they're at your door. Everything I own is the Lord's. I'm going to seek him for what he wants and I'm not going to do it at this moment. I'm not going to be put under pressure. And the Lord doesn't work that way, and you shouldn't either. So we'll leave that to the Lord. It's the wisdom to just take time and seek the Lord. Getting treasures by a lying tongue is the fleeting fantasy of those who seek death. So it's kind of like that eating the bread earlier and the gravel. Getting treasures by a lying tongue, we should never, ever seek treasure by that. There's no peace in that. Then there's the worry of being caught if it's illegal activity. It looks what it looks like. And it's a fleeting fantasy. It's fleeting. It's not even yours. You're certainly not going to take it to heaven with you. But if you earn stuff by good, good measure, good hard work, and, you, and you, you devote your life to the Lord, your time and efforts and the money, well, you can take that treasure to heaven and that investment in the Lord. So that's not a fleeting fantasy. That's something that has eternal consequences. So, so using deceit to gain wealth is very dangerous. It does only lead to death. So we're not to go there. Again, a lot of issues about honesty tonight in some of these verses. The violence of the wicked will destroy them, 
And he even tells us why, because they refuse to do justice. So the violence of the wicked. So if you're a wicked person, there's no real right and wrong. I can use violence. I can use whatever I means to take whatever I want to take from somebody. I can covet my neighbor's goods and then just go take it from them. And the violence will destroy you. If you use violence, it's going to end up having to come back against you through the police or through the whatever that uh, it will end up taking us down. And the reason is they refuse to do justice because they refuse to do things the proper way, to do stuff without the worry of anxiety of being caught and all that. It's going to end up costing you your life, whether it's life in jail or whatever, but the greater loss, again, the eternal loss of not turning to the Lord. So again, we're not to resort to violence. We're not to resort to being wicked, to deceiving, to stealing. We want to be people of justice. Verse 8, the way of a guilty man is perverse. As for the pure, his work is right. So you've got a choice to make in life. You can take a way or take a path that is right. The word perverse simply means twisted. So that's, it's really as perverse or twisted. The way of a guilty man, a man that has a guilty conscience. Isn't it great, as 1 John 1 9 says as Christians, God not only forgives us of our sins, but cleanses us. And there's a verse in Hebrews, I think, makes the clear connection. That cleansing is the cleansing of our conscience. And to walk around in, in this world without a cleansed conscience is very dangerous, very hurtful. And God doesn't want that for us. So let's get these, let's get these issues right. Let's get the con can conscience cleansed by the Lord and, uh, and then look at that. Then the way of the pure, his work is right. So that we have that conscience cleansed. We're walking with the Lord. We're doing what's right. And, the, and that person's work is right. And God has work for us to do. Say by faith and faith alone, as we know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us, then verse 10 says, but we are created for good works. This work that he has prepared for us to do, he has good work planned for us. Okay, verse 9, better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Now let me cover myself here a little bit. This can go both ways, men and women. Not, I'm not going to pick on women. Solomon gave this side of the story. Oh, by the way, let, let's look at a little, little history that's building up. Do you remember chapter 19, verse 13? Please look back at that. 1913. It said, A foolish son is the ruin of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dripping. You know that nagging sound when that thing keeps dripping in the background? You think a contentious wife is like that, just <laughs> nagging, whatever you want to call it. Remember, a man can be that to his wife, too. But notice the progression. First, it's like a continual dripping. And now the guy's just up on the corner of his roof, just happy to have a peaceful corner of the roof. I'll take that. Now, it's an interesting picture. We don't have people sitting on roofs. In the Middle East, it's very common because they, they typically build their homes with a flat top so that in the, certainly in the arid desert area in the south of, of Jerusalem or south of Israel, they go up there in the night and the nice breeze comes through. And so the, the, it's very much used as a living space. But a guy's like, I'd rather have just one little corner of the top, housetop it, in peace than have a contentious wife. Again, it could be the other way. A wife just said, rather just have my corner. We're to love each other. Men, you're to love your wives. Be good to her. Make it easy for her to want to submit to you, being the picture of the church submitted to a great Savior in Jesus. You're to love her. Die to yourself every day. Make it a sweet marriage for her. And that you won't have to be that way and won't have to resort to that. But first that, and then we're going to see a little bit, a few verses later, he's going to say, now the guy's not even on his housetop, he's out in the wilderness. But we'll get to that a little bit later. So let's be gentle and kind and loving within our marriages. And let's be that great picture of Jesus loving his bride and her responding to his great leadership and to being willing to die for her. Verse 10, the soul of the wicked desires evil. Of course it does. Remember the soul is the mental, emotional makeup. The evil, that's what they desire is evil. They have been regenerated by the Lord to have a desire for the things of good and the things of the Lord. And so that's what they want. His neighbor finds no favor in his eyes. So now it's interesting, you may read this. Okay, the soul of the wicked desires evil. And so his neighbor finds no favor in his eyes, his, the eyes of the wicked. Why? Because he's all about himself. Of course, he desires evil and he has no compassion, he has no care, he has no concern for his neighbors. So his neighbor finds no favor in his eyes. We're supposed to care for our neighbor, love them and look out for them and be a good neighbor. Jesus said, who's the neighbor to that man? Think about the man with the man that got beaten up and then the religious leaders walked right on by. 
And then the Samaritan came along and took care of him. He was the good neighbor. Let's be good neighbors and let's not desire evil. Let's desire good for people. Verse 11, when the scoffer is punished, the simple is made wise. The second one about discipline, we saw verse 30 of the last chapter, blows that hurt, cleanse away evil. Well, this is interesting. When the scoffer is punished, what he's basically saying was the scoffer is punished when a guy that's a mocker and a brawler and an evil person and, and they're actually legitimately disciplined, the simple person looks at that and goes, oh, what happened there? There's a cost to disobedience. I don't want to do that. You ever watch somebody do really dumb things and you watch them get caught? Like, eh, that's not worth it. I don't want to go there. We're to learn from these things. So when the scoffer is punished, the simple is made wise. And the bigger spiritual picture, the scoffer of the Lord their end is destruction eternally. And that's why we're to actually pray for them. We don't want that upon our worst enemy to miss out on what God has planned for their lives. So, but when the wise is instructed, he receives instruction. The scoffer doesn't receive the instruction, so they keep on that ugly, bad, broad road to destruction, and it ends up destroying them. But the wise listen. We heed instruction, uh, particularly the instruction of the Lord. Verse 12, the righteous God wisely considers the house of the wicked, overthrowing the wicked for their wickedness. Now, God sees everything. Sometimes we can wonder and go, is God ever going to deal with wickedness? Is he, sometimes our biggest issue of struggling with wickedness is the timing of the Lord. Not that he's, he's going to judge them. We just don't think he's quick enough sometimes. The problem is if God came and did away with all evil today, not a one of us would be alive. Yes, we're saved. Yes, we're perfect in the Lord, but we all have evil in our hearts still. We still sin every day. And so, if, if we say, if God, why don't you wipe out evil? If he had to wipe it, where does he draw the line? If he, draw, if he wipes out all evil, not a one of us would be alive. So, it's just interesting here. But he does consider that. The word consider means to have insight or to give attention. God is not, it's not just slipping by him un, un, unknown. He's taking note. And, and those deeds are written, written in the books, and they'll be judged, the great white throne judgment, if they don't turn to the Lord. So don't think the Lord's not noticing. It's how we can leave vengeance to him, because he is, he is wisely considering the house of the wicked. He will overthrow them. It will come, the day will come. Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. Boy, that is a wake-up call to people. If you ever walk by a poor person, you act, literally act like you didn't even hear him or see him. The Lord says, don't do that. I, I find it interesting the timing of this. We've been looking at a lot of verse about the poor. God really loves the poor. I'm actually very excited. Saturday, we're going to send out some teams, and we're going to 40 doors of, of elderly people in our community that are very poor. And we're going to take a big bag of stuff we bought. And, you know, toothpaste, toothbrush, some nice socks, and um, non-slip socks, and, and uh, shampoo, and a little bit of food, and different things. And, and we're just going to love on them. We're going to ask them for permission to come back and talk to them about the Lord. I do want them to know why we're there, because God loves you. I just want to give it to them and say, here you go, see ya. I do want them to know it's the Lord's love that draw, drove us to go say hi to them. So we're going to be very gentle, but we want to love them for the Lord. So the Lord wants us to really have a heart open for the Lord and for the poor. And that's what we are to do. So if you shut it, the Lord says, well, well you'll also cry and not be heard. Why would you expect me to be kind to you if you're going to be blowing off people that are really in need around you? Read James if you need an encouragement in this area. He talks about that need to not ignore those that are in need around us. We're to be open. Remember, everything we own is the Lord's. If he redirects your finances, it's his money to be redirected. Let's be open to the leading of the Lord. All right. A gift in secret pacifies anger and a bribe behind the back strong wrath. Now, let me just make one comment real quick. The word bribe there, even though it talks about gift in the first half, and bribe, that word bribe doesn't necessarily mean bribe. It can simply mean a gift. So it doesn't have to be taken negatively, although behind the back is a little interesting phrase. It does kind of tend to make you think. It might be along the lines of kind of bribing somebody because they got angry. But we have to admit, this is, this is just a truth in life. You do something to somebody, sometimes a gift is a good thing. I think first should come the apology. When you'd be humble enough to say, I'm really sorry I did that to you. I'm sorry I hurt you. Would you please forgive me? But a gift works sometimes. Men, how many times have you taken a bouquet of flowers to your wife after you said something dumb and you knew you needed to make it right? 
Usually they're real good about being thankful for those flowers. I mean, it's the truth. A gift in secret pacifies anger. It typically does. It actually communicates, I care about you. And it should. Remember, the. let me say, the, the need to apologize and ask for is more important than that gift. It's kind of like back to that thing about the Lord and sacrifice. Rather you do right. The better thing is to apologize. Anyway, a bride behind the back turns away strong wrath. And it could just mean because he talked about in secret, hey, let's not do big old fanfare when you're making things right. If you make things right, just get the gift and give to him. Tell you're sorry and try to mend the relationship. And it will even turn away strong wrath or strong anger. So I, I still don't necessarily see this word bribe in this verse as being a negative. Uh, by the way, this almost seems like a good thing to be able to pacify that. A bribe is not a good thing. So uh, we'll go with the softer angle. It is a joy for the just to do justice. It's a joy for the just to to do justice. I hope it is. What's the old saying? Being good as its own reward. Isn't it nice to just do something nice to people and, and the joy of doing that? That's a good thing. We should do that in life. <clears throat> but destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. It's good to do good and it's bad to do bad and it'll cost you. And it'll cost you in the life to come if you don't make things right with the Lord. Let's let the Lord lead us and guide us in all these things. All right, verse 16, a man who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. Now, this is an interesting verse because I think you could, in a way, look at it from the angle of the unbeliever. The unbeliever is made with an inherent sense of an inquisitiveness to the Lord. Why do children have so many questions? God made them that way. And with a sense they're the creator. And so if they, if they veer away from that path of understanding, it's going to lead to death. They're going to end up resting in the assembly uh, of the dead. And then some people go, well, that applies more to a believer, a man who wanders from the way of understanding. And in that case, they'll apply it, some will, more in the angle of uh, leading to some really bad decisions lead to a physical death. I tend to look more at the spiritual angle of this particular verse. You can take it either way you'd like. I think there is some application for both, but I see more on the spiritual sense to wander from the path God planned for your life to come to him. That's the blessed life. Verse 70, he who loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. This duck, bottom line, uh, and I think it, this, uh, one another one's verses has a very physical as well as a spiritual connotation to it. But let's face it, the person that's spiritually all about pleasure, all about me, that is a miserable life. That is not the way God made us. He made us that if you give your life away, Jesus famously said, the man who gives his life away or loses his life will find it. You get older in life and you find yourself giving more of yourself to other people, that's the blessed life. If you watch people older in life, they're all about themselves, they tend to be bitter and just, I, I, it's, it's, to me it's tragic watching an old life that's all about myself. It's just, it's a sad life. It's not an investing life, it's not an other-centered life, it's simply not like Jesus. And so we don't want to be aiming at pleasure in life. I want to be, by the way, the most pleasurable life is a life of giving yourself away. So just love the Lord, give your life away, find life, and find the enjoyment in life. And so so a person that's all after wealth and pleasure, uh, you won't be rich. It's going to lead to no spiritual richness at all. Verse 18, the wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the unfaithful for the upright. Now, I have to admit, this is an odd verse. You ever read a verse and go, I don't know how in the world that verse makes any sense. This is one for me. Think about it. Who is our ransom? Jesus is our ransom. He paid the price for our sin. How in the world can the wicked be a ransom for us? And so when I look at a verse like that, I go, I don't have any understanding. I start looking at every verse, every word in the verse. And the one that makes sense to me is, is that helps this verse make sense to me, is the word for. If you notice that word for, that word can mean away or from. And so I read this verse as, the wicked shall be a, a ransom away from the righteous. They'll pay their price away from me in the everlasting lake of fire. And I don't want that for them. God doesn't want that for them. And the unfaithful away or from the upright. So let's be loving on the wicked so hopefully they'll turn and not be suffering those eternal consequences of separation from the Lord. They will pay the ransom price. I'm glad Jesus paid it for me. And so I don't have to pay that price 
of eternal separation and pain from the Lord. So anyway, that's how I translate that verse. Likely some plenty of other ways to translate it. Verse 19, better to dwell in the wilderness. Okay, here's that guy that had the dripping wife and then lived on the corner of the housetop. And now he's just, I'm just gonna live in the wilderness. Just give me some room, lady, and uh, I got to get out of here. So better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Now remember, this could go another way than with a contentious and angry man. Men, don't be this to your wives. But she's saying, you know, the greatest thing in life is just peace, and especially if you're blessed to have a loving companion in life. Man who finds a wife finds a good thing. The Lord told us. Let's let's be nurturing them and loving them men and enjoy a good healthy marriage with our wives and can't i don't know about you but i just can't wait to get home at the end of the day to be with my wife i'm so blessed and so anyway i'd never want to live in the wilderness anyway even even with her so anyway verse 20 there's a desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise why is that because the wise are seeking the lord and when we have wisdom from the Lord, it leads to all, it leads to spiritual wealth. Sometimes it leads to physical wealth. I think in this case, the more of the spiritual application, desirable treasure, man, we're the wealthiest people in the world. We're joint heirs with Christ. Oil represents the Holy Spirit. Can't always apply that. We looked at one earlier that was not good, but oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man squanders it. A foolish man squanders this amazing offer of wealth from the Lord. Amazing offer of wealth. Take the Lord up on it. Don't squander that. Take it for all it's worth. So I'm going to take a picture of that. Look at the prodigal son. Talk about squandering wealth from his father. At least he came to his senses and woke up and came back. That was a smart man when he was finally humbled to come back. He who follows righteousness and mercy, well, that should be all of us as Christians. I hope every day you can't wait to wake up and, Lord, I want to read your word. I want to follow you, come after you, righteousness and mercy. And if I do that, I'm going to find life every day, righteousness and honor. That is the blessed life, to seek that and gain it from the Lord. It's only found in the Lord. Seek it out with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. A wise man skills the city of the mighty. Well, how do you do that? Think about the city of the mighty. This is not just scaling the city of the mighty. Think of the old cities and the fortified walls. And to scale that wall, you had to have some, some great knowledge how to do that. And then it's, it's the city of the mighty. So there's mighty warriors. When you get over that wall, only the wise can conquer that and brings down the trusted stronghold. So when you walk with the Lord, doesn't matter how big and strong that city is, doesn't matter how mighty they appear, God can take them down. Think of Jericho, walk around the city once, six days, seven day walk around, seven. he just knocked the walls down. Just go in and take it. And when we're walking with the Lord, he'll make whatever city, he'll make it, he'll make it available to us, whatever it is uh, picturally uh, in the Lord as we're walking with him. Let's take the cities that he has planned for us. Verse 23, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. Isn't that the truth? How many things have you said in life you've regretted? Oh, James warns us, no one can tame the tongue, no man, but God can. Never forget, if you're submitted to the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with self-control, you'll have not just a filter of what comes in your mind, you'll have a filter of what comes out of your mouth. Let's make sure we have filtered our mouths by the control of the Holy Spirit. Let's be walking at a slow pace that we're hearing from the Lord. That will keep your soul, your mental and emotional state from trouble. That again is the blessed life. Let's not get ourselves into trouble with the things we say. All right, a, a proud and haughty man scoffer is his name now this is interesting we've already looked at the word scoffer in fact i looked it up to you. the word scoffer appears many many times in proverbs proverbs 9 chapter 13 chapter 14 15 17 19 20 this chapter a couple of times 22 and 24 and we actually get a definition a proud and haughty man that's a scoffer we already looked at proud and haughty earlier so that's a person the lord calls a scoffer and he acts with arrogant pride. Of course he does. He's prideful and arrogant. And that's why he acts that way. Again, let me ask, let the Lord search your heart. If there's anyone you're looking down on, that's haughtiness and pride. Don't do it. We can be Christians and have that in our hearts. Let the Lord reveal that. And again, the greatest remedy against that is compare yourself to the Lord. Stop comparing yourself to another person. You're in the process of being conformed into Jesus' image, not your neighbor. They're not the standard. 
He is. That'll keep you from pride and haughtiness, and we don't want to be a scoffer. And so that is pleasing to the Lord. Verse 25, the desire of the lazy man kills him. There you go. For his hands, why? For his hands refuse to labor. Yeah, it's going to kill him. He's too lazy to get up and go to work. So his desire is to be lazy, and that's why it kills him. Because then he won't go to work, and then he doesn't have money to buy food, and he's going to go hungry, and he's going to die. And then who wants to hire that man? And, of course, his hands refuse to labor. That's why the Lord tells us about a hungry mouth drives him on, the lazy person. Or in the, in the New Testament, we're told, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. God wants that drive in a person. Because think about it, if you go to work, you're serving someone else. That's a healthy thing. That's a part of giving your life away. So to be self-centered and never doing anything for anyone else, that is not a healthy life. And it ends up killing the person. Really, you know, just a slow soul, a mentional, uh, just death that's unhealthy. And so um, we need to seem to walk with the Lord and do what the Lord's called us to do. Verse 26, he covets greedily all day long, but the righteous gives and does not spare. Now notice there's no lead into who the he is. So I think he's referring to the lazy man in the verse before. So he, the lazy man, covets greedily all day long. He doesn't do anything, but he sure wants what everybody else has. We're not going to get there by being lazy. And so the righteous gives and does not spare. Remember, gives, I mentioned... To be lazy, I'm always thinking myself, but God made us and wired us in a way that true contentment in life is to give my life away. That's where it is. So laziness looks, looks nothing like that. That's not what the Lord has for us. Let's be giving, hardworking people, not to earn something from the Lord, but to say thank you for what he's done and to serve him and with our finances and everything else. Verse 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. Remember, earlier we talked about it's better to just obey rather than give a sacrifice. So now we're talking about the sacrifice of a wicked. That person that thinks that somehow I can give something and now God's going to accept me because of my giving. I can't help, sometimes when I look at this, I think of the person that's been maybe wicked their whole lives. Have you ever noticed how sometimes, and I'm not calling them all wicked by any stretch, you can be very wealthy and be very righteous before the Lord and be walking in obedience to the Lord. Have you ever noticed how oftentimes people can get to the end of their lives and become amazingly philanthropic when they're really, really wealthy? And sometimes I, can't, I just wonder, I'm not saying it's true, I wonder are they now trying to earn their way to God through these gifts? And there's the wicked, if they are that, not all of them are wicked. And now they're trying to bring this sacrifice. If now God will accept me. I've been wicked my whole life, don't want to change a thing, but if I just give this money away, somehow he'll accept me. He won't accept that. He'll only accept repentance and accepting Jesus and his forgiveness. And so the sacrifice, that's an abomination to the Lord. He hates it. How much more when he brings it with wicked intent? And then that's almost like, now I gave this, now you owe me to let me into heaven. No, I don't. No, I don't. I told you the very gracious offer through Jesus. You rejected it. Verse 28, a false witness shall perish, but a man who hears will speak endlessly. So that's an interesting verse here as we look at that. Of course, a false witness shall perish. Uh, do you remember back in the Old Testament, one of the interesting things to me in the law of Moses is if you accuse somebody of a crime and you were lying and they found out, you were to assume the sentence. So if you accuse somebody of killing someone and you were caught lying, you were put to death. That would keep you from being a false witness. That's a good deterrent. So, but you look at that, but the man who hears him will speak Endlessly. Now, there's some, I call some different ways to kind of translate that. Some, uh, you know, seems to speak of the person who believes uh, the false witness. You ever notice that somebody gives a false witness and the person who believes them, they're just out blabbing this lie. And I don't know if it's that. It could be. So I'll leave you to, anyway, the man who hears him. And the word hear means heeds. So if you believe that lie, you might make the mistake of going to their defense and trying to defend them, the false witness. Let's be very careful. We hear both sides of a story on anything so that we know the truth as situations are coming up uh, in life. Verse 29, a wicked man hardens his face. As it's hard as me. It's just a picture of what's happening internally as they're hardening their hearts and they're searing their conscience. Yeah, he hardens his face. He just becomes a hard man. But as for the upright, he establishes his way. Let's not harden our face. Let's be soft and be upright and establish our way in righteousness and in truth. And that's not a hardened life. That's a joy-filled life. And it's a life at the end of no regret. It's a peaceful life. There's no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
You can say all you want against the Lord. It will not stand. God's word is truth. That will stand and nothing more. At the end of the day, that's all that's going to exist. Not one jot or tittle of the Lord's word is going to not last into eternity. Thank you, Lord. He's going to rule by righteousness, and we'll get to see it. Jesus' thousand-year reign and the new heaven and new earth. He'll be ruled by God's justice. Can't wait for that day. And so God's counsel will stand. Last verse tonight, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. You know, this is an interesting verse, and to me, I just happen to go back to, if you remember in Deuteronomy 17, one of the things the Lord required of every king of Israel was they had to by hand personally write down, write out the law of Moses. I tend to wonder if it was all of the five books, the Pentateuch, the first five books. And the reason the Lord did it, he didn't want any king to claim ignorance of his law. But one of the things right in the section in Deuteronomy 17 where he told the king had to write everything down, he told him, whatever you do, do not multiply horses. And I think the simple reason was, if you multiply horses, and by, imp by implication, soldiers and what else, on the day of battle, you're going to trust in your, in your number of horses. As when God rebuked him for it. And you're trusting now in numbers rather than in the Lord. All it takes is one person in the Lord. It doesn't even take one person. It just takes the Lord. It doesn't matter who comes against him. When Jesus comes back to the battle, battle of Armageddon, it's not a battle. They're going to pull out their swords and be dead. Just toast. It's over. He's just going to speak. So we are not to trust in human understanding, human weapons, human anything. Yeah, you can take that horse. You can prepare for battle. But it's always of the Lord. The deliverance, the victory, the everything is from the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being so great and always, always being so amazing and so great. So many beautiful Proverbs tonight. We end, let me just give the two same uh, really applications I've been giving in all of these, um, especially in this second section. We continue to be encouraged and challenged to know the will of the Lord. Let's make sure every step or every, everything we do, everything we walk in in life, every decision we make, it's of the Lord. Let's try to walk at a pace in life that we're in tune with the Lord and hearing from the Lord. And any check in our spirit that we don't have peace, don't enter into anything. Wait on the Lord. Remember, Jesus was at, he was, he was at a methodical pace everywhere. There's not a single passage in Scripture where God is portrayed as running, except one, when he's represented by the father of the prodigal son. And when that son was repentant, he ran to him. Other than that, God is always at such a pace. There's no rush. Let's not be hasty in what we make decisions in life. Let's know the will of the Lord, be hearing from the Lord, and let's seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit at all times. That is the blessed life. So let me close in prayer. We'll open for a couple of uh, quick questions here before we close in worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. We are so blessed. So blessed that you have taken the time in your wisdom, in the wisdom of your Holy Spirit, to write down these amazing Proverbs. All of your word is amazing everywhere we turn in it. And we thank you and praise you for it, Lord. So, Lord, if there's some areas in this, these many verses we've looked at tonight that you need to work on, Lord, help us to spend some time, even tonight, if not in the morning, whatever, just spend some time really pondering that with you and, and let your Holy Spirit really speak to us. And Lord, you do want to speak to us. You're a speaking God. And so please help us to hear your voice and walk in your ways and walk in your obedience. Help us to be changed persons by the presence and the work and the power and the fruit of your Holy Spirit. So thank you, Lord. We do thank you and praise you again tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Three or four minutes here for questions, if there are any. <coughs> any questions? No? Got to have something. No? All right. Justin, Megan, why don't you come on up? Oh, okay. Yeah, Chad? Um, this might be a dumb question, but it's getting So Solomon wrote the Proverbs, right? Yes, he did. Is that, he knows that before he gets to be found, he made all those beds. 
That's a great. <clears throat> that is a great question. Now we know at least he had, we believe he had children at this point, right? He says, my son, my son, over and over and over in chapters one through nine, and then he will a little bit in chapters 22 through 24. So I believe it was a little bit older in life, probably after he made many, many of these mistakes. Probably a lot of these things he's writing is out of regret, probably, right? It's almost harder to write when you know what a fool you've been. That's a great question. We really don't know, really don't know. I think what's no surprise to me is the Lord put the book of Ecclesiastes right after this. That's Solomon's overall assessment of life of having now been a fool, being, as the Bible describes, the wisest man that ever lived in terms of just pure wisdom and knowing how to apply things, but then not applying a lick of it to himself. <laughs> oh my gosh. But he'll, he'll teach us, I've learned what a fool I've been. Right? That's where we clearly know he's at. That one, we, we have a sense it's at the end of his life, but unfortunately we don't know, other than he at least had sons that were, appear to be grown. So it was, it was probably later in life, but I wish he'd have learned the lessons, right? And, uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I think just sometimes we're just, uh, let's face it, we're a little dense, right? It takes a while to learn things. As in the Conqueror series, we've been watching the guy talk about one Sunday morning when he said, one more is feeling especially spiritual. I said, Lord, if there's something you want to reveal to me, do that. And then they had this horrible experience where he had his car door open and, and he was getting frustrated. His wife wasn't coming down the car fast enough. And so he got out of the car and he didn't realize he left it in reverse. And he wrapped that door around the pole and ruined the door. And yeah, the, I, I love that. He said, Lord, you know, did you really have to show me that? Couldn't you just told me? He said, no, you, you wouldn't have remembered it, but I showed you so you'd remember it. So. <laughs> So as the Lord knows what we need. But anyway, yeah, I wish we'd learned these lessons earlier in life. It'd be better to learn them from someone else's mistakes uh, than our own. So anyway, there you go. Thanks for asking that, Chad. Let's stand and let's, uh, let's sing and close out our night before the Lord.
Let's pray. Father, we just thank you and praise you that we are so blessed to be able to come freely in this country into a room like this and worship you openly. Praise you and thank you for how tremendous you are. And we don't even know the half of it. When we get to heaven and have a new body and a new brain to handle the greatness of who you are, Lord, I look forward to that day so, so sweetly that day will be. So thank you, Lord. Tonight, Lord, continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to learn the things you want us to learn. If there's something you want to work on, we invite that great work of the searching and the revealing of your Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds to become more like Christ, our great and mighty Savior. So bless us, we pray, Lord. Thank you for your word again. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you and coming to you and praising you and talking to you and everything we get to do because of Jesus. We thank you and ask all things in his name, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each of you. Thank you.